if you were making a game and you just wanted to quickly create some character or some object in the game, it'd be very valuable to be able to give the thing a photo of it and then have it hang you back a depth map, which is what those depth descriptions really are, and then show it a second photo from a different angle and get another depth map. Now you're in a position to start building a 3D mesh of the object and actually putting it into the game. One of the implications of the, the depth map and um, connecting to video gaming, allowing game designers to take just photos and then getting this into their world without them having to either hand design it or take 15 different photos from so many different angles, um, which can be super time consuming and costly. Hey everyone, welcome to this like podcast. We're talking about business and AI. If you like business and tech and if you're pro new tech, this is your show. If you're pro ice cream, this is your show, which reminds me I owe Joe yes. that pistachio ice cream, but of course yes. the, the flu hit and, or the fever hit, but we'll get that taken care of. The ice cream mix. Or, it, or flow. Flow 2 works just like for Dune, which speaking of very sad, Dune 2 is being delayed until March. Very sad. I was looking forward to having it. Fanboy. it I know I am. Latent diffusion models, LDMs, exhibit an impressive ability to produce realistic images, yet inner workings of these models remain mysterious. Joe. Enlighten us. What so this paper is about? Talked about Jan LeCun and his point that these models did not have world models. Mm -hmm. And we followed that up with Andrew Ng's reaction to the Othello ML paper, where they essentially showed that this thing that was trained on sequence of Othello moves uh, ended up building an internal representation of the Othello board, which is like a world model. And so Andrew was basically saying, hey, it looks like these models could be building world models. This is a simple one, but it suggests that more sophisticated ones might be present in the larger models. And the way that they saw that was they put probes on the interior layers, the inner layers of the model. And those probes allowed them to see what those layers were doing as the model was running. So this paper is even more of that, and the results are even more exciting. Essentially, what they're doing is they are using a diffusion model. And we already talked about this before, but I'll just repeat it. A diffusion model starts with something that looks like pure noise. So if you look at the top row there, I think it's the top row, what you're displaying now. Yeah. And where you see step one, you look at that and you're like, that's just gibberish. It's just nothing but static, right? Pure noise. And then the diffusion model goes through steps, usually like 30 steps. Here there's 15 steps. And on the right, after the 15th step, it's got this nice picture of a car. Fantastic. Now, the next couple rows are probes showing us what's happening inside the model as it's going towards this final state of displaying a car. And if you look at the leftmost column, even when the initial image looks like total noise, the interior of the model is already starting to separate out some very interesting information. The second row is a depth map. So what it's basically saying is, I already think that some parts of this image are closer to the camera, the viewer, and some parts of this image are further back, they're in the background. So the blue and purple are far away, and the red stuff is what I think is close to us. And you can see as it gets through the generations, the steps, the final one where it's got a picture of a car, like the front tire of the car is right on top of you. It's right in your face. The other parts of the car are further away and the grass behind the car is even further away. The horizon's way out there. Fantastic. But the model has a sense of what it's seeing all the way at the first step when what we're seeing is nothing but static. At least that's what I'm seeing. Maybe somebody else is seeing a picture already. And even more so, if you keep going down, there's this fourth row the second from the bottom, where it's essentially separating the figure, the important thing in the image, the, the item that dominates the image, from the background. And the, in, in this visualization, the figure's in white, the background's in black, and you can see that it's got a pretty good sense. Okay, I already see there's something in this area of the image that I think is the main thing. And then there's this area that's in black that's, I think, just background, not so important. And then that shape of that thing is refined pretty quickly over the steps until in the final column on the right, it's clearly an outline of the car. It's basically saying, this is what I think is the important thing in this image. There's a whole bunch of interesting things going on here. Number one, it has a sense of what it thinks is interesting from the very beginning when we're still dealing with noise. Number two, at the end, when it's really got a clean picture of the car, 
This thing has a mask for what it thinks is the most important object in the image, which is already valuable. Normally, that's hard to do. It's difficult to take an arbitrary image and say, not only do I want you to give me all the shapes that are in this image, but I want you to tell me which one is the most important one in the image, and I want you to create a mask for it. There's other whole models that are developed for that, like the, there's one from Facebook about segment anything, for example. Anyway, these probes show us that the diffusion model has a very good idea of what it's about, and it has that idea very early in the process. That's, thank you for breaking that down so clearly. And also it is amazing how quickly these photos can just, how this machine or this pro algorithm can take this nothingness of this blurry image and already think, oh, okay, I have an idea. There's something there. Whereas if you just showed me step three by itself without showing step one and two, I would have said this is just blur as nothing. It's only until you put step one and two down there. I could say maybe it's step three. Okay. There's something there. The fact that this was able to get an idea of what it is in step one is, is an amazing advantage for it to have like a first mover's advantage, being able to identify something there and see a pattern where humans couldn't see it. And then how it was able to determine depth perception, I thought was really fascinating. And so it gained this capability though, of what looking at thousands or millions of synthetic images or doing the training that we mentioned previously of an image plus adding some fuzziness and then guessing what the previous image was and just doing that pattern over and over again. Exactly. It's learned this ability. And also remember, this is passive. All we're doing here is looking at what its interior sort of process is, what it's pulling out of the noise and what it thinks it's leading up to in the final result. The next step here would be just like with the Othello paper, they took the representation of the board and they messed with it and said, no, there's not a piece there and there's a piece over here. And then they forced it to do different moves, right? They essentially messed with its world model and got it to do, to, to make different moves in its output. In theory, you could do the same here. You could reach into this model and you could mess with its sense of the depth or its sense of the mask, and you would get a different result at the end. Fascinating. Again, we're getting, or getting to the point where now the LMs, the mysterious nature of how they're thinking and seeing things, we can now actually see how they look at these images, which makes them less scary and it gives us more understanding of how they operate. Let's go to here. I think they're doing the same exercise here, but they're doing it with birds and families and things like that. Right. They're showing you different images and its sense of foreground and background creating a mask and also its model of depth perception. Nice. If you were making a game and you just wanted to quickly create some character or some object in the game, it'd be very valuable to be able to give the thing a photo of it and then have it hang you back a depth map, which is what those depth descriptions really are, and then show it a second photo from a different angle and get another depth map. Now you're in a position to start building a 3D mesh of the object and actually putting it into the game. Oh, so those are the, I mean, there's a lot of implications for this, but one of the implications of the, the depth map and um, connecting to video gaming, allowing game designers to take just photos and then getting this into their world without them having to either hand design it or take 15 different photos from so many different angles, um, which could be super time consuming and costly. Nice. Any other takeaways you had from this paper? Was there other research that you think they could, is there a next natural step the researchers should be doing? I think the, the implications are interesting. What it leads up to is these different probes are letting us see the process that the model is using internally, and they potentially open up more control over that process. So the next steps would be, how do we make use of what we're seeing in the internal state? And how do we influence the direction that we want the model to go? So for example, I show you that foreground background, that, that black and white mask. What if you could just adjust it? And that's what they're doing here in the image you currently have. They're basically picking up the foreground object and they're moving it somewhere else in the image. And then they're letting the generation continue. And the result is actually different. So in that first, or say in the second row, they have a bust, a statue. And they basically let the model turn that into a mask. Okay, great. 
And then they say, what if I picked that mask up and I moved it somewhere else in the image and then I let the model continue? And what you get is a new statue that's in a new position that corresponds to where you move that mask. So you're essentially influencing how the model is going to work by messing with its, its internal representation. Hey, it's Jordan from the Sick Podcast. I hope you're enjoying this jam-packed episode of Awesome Research. You should support the channel by becoming a supporter. Once you become a supporter, you will then be invited to our private community here on YouTube, which will allow you to see the research me and Joe are reading and also research from other people in the community. It's only $4.99 a month, and it's a really good investment. You should go to your boss and look him straight in the face and be like, hey, I am a man or a woman, and you should invest in my future by giving me $4.99 a month so I can invest in the sick podcast and learn about research. And then your manager will be like, that's a great idea. High five, and then probably promote you on the spot or fire you. But either way, we still get our $4.99, and you still get awesome research, and you can help support the show. Why don't you right now go to our page, click join, and then go to supporter and click join again, and then you can join in on all the research fun. Hope you're enjoying the episode. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and don't forget to support our show. Talk to you later. Bye. Now that is awesome, because when I'm a mid-journey or dolly generating something, it's put my prompt in, and then I do the sign of the cross, and I hope it works <laughs> out. <laughs> and sometimes in mid-journey, it shows you the generations, and oh, you're like, lucky seven. Right, exactly, <laughs> lucky lady night. And so, and sometimes you're at seventy percent generated, and you're like, oh, this is this is what I want. And they get so 100%, you're like, oh, no, <laughs> no. what happened? No. And so if they start allowing you to control the process of when this is being generated and to play with it, oh, that would be awesome. Because right now it's basically put your prompt in. Or no, actually, mid-journey would do. Credit to them. Put your prompt in, and then we'll give you four different generations that came out from this with a little bit of, because you can put a chaos number into it to make it, mm -hmm. to, to add more creativity to the model. Mm -hmm. But then after that's done, then you can say, okay, of the four, the third one, do more generation stuff of that one. And it's better than nothing. But what you're showing here is I can actually be involved in the process and help help it take shape and actually create real art, I believe. To my, that's really cool. I hope this gets deployed into these image generation models soon because we need to give the user more control of the process. Let's see here. So again, this is another thing that Adobe should be looking for to be putting into their products. Anyone working on an image generator? I'm sure you'll see, you'll see results from this paper get used in things like Mid Journey or Stable Diffusion. Mm -hmm. uh, probably also Adobe Firefly at some point in the future. Nice. Yeah, this is gosh, all the new AI technology. If you had told me it was going to create a renaissance in just graphic design, I would have said no. Nah, that's not where it's going to start. But that's like where it is right now. So thank you for sharing this information. For all y'all who are generating AI images, let us know what you think. Would you like to have the ability to actually take part in generation process and move objects around to then influence the final creation? Anyways, you can, you can subscribe and share, and we'll see you next video. Peace.